Let's pray together. Our Father, what an honor it is. God, to be here with all of our precious family at Wales. And Father, we thank you Sometimes we sense your tenderness through a child. God, in your compassion, in your care, and the fact that as tender and compassionate as you are, you rule the universe. God, you rule the <laughs> God, the, the forces of darkness, and God, is, as I've heard others say, there's not one stray molecule in all this universe that you don't direct in everything that goes on. Father, we're grateful that we worship not just a God, but the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the King of kings. And Father, I pray that this morning, God, that your word would be faithfully spoken and that your people would be strengthened. And God, as you promised in Isaiah, that your word will not return void. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your promise, for your presence. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 had kind of a, a little break and a look in Colossians and um, just as a, a quick review um, or to bring everybody up to speed that may not have been here before that it, Paul wrote this letter to the church of Colossae uh, after being uh, or while being visited by uh, Epaphras um, who was probably the pastor there of the church at, at Colossae. And Paul was in prison and for the gospel. And as pastor of this church at Colossae, there was there were some things going on that um, that Paul, that the Paphras thought was threatening to the church. Some teaching that was was going to undermine the gospel or and undermine the things that that Paul had been teaching and preaching and that had led uh, this man to Christ himself and. And as pastor of this church, he was concerned. And I, 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 this was an early writing, and, and some of the, the deceptive practices um, were hard to nail down. I mean, there was no term for it. It was like something was just all over the place. And it kind of like today. You know, you can hear anything and everything today that, that can lead a tendency to lead people astray from the faith in Christ. I mean, it comes from everywhere, from every, every from, from society itself, from our culture, and even from some churches and preachers, you can hear some things that are so unbiblical, it's, it's incredible. And I, I, I am great, greatly admire this man because even though there wasn't something that you could nail it down and say, well, this was Gnosticism or this was um, Arianism. You know, I don't know if you know who Arius was, but he was the man that said that Christ was a created being, that Christ was a was the first creation of God. It was called the Arian um, heresy. And, you know, for the longest time they had put that down. That was defeated. But, you know, it's, it's alive and well today. Arianism is. People that believe that Jesus was a created being. Jehovah's Witnesses, that's what they believe. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was the first created being. Um, it's amazing how we let things go. Um, and this pastor, 
Epaphras, he wasn't willing to do that. So he wanted to go to Paul. He wasn't sure how to deal with it. So he went to Paul to ask him, Paul, how do we deal with this? I've got these people that are bringing some strange teachings in, and people are starting to, I'm hearing things, people say things that makes me think, well, that's, where did they get that? I mean, you can hear the same thing today in churches, maybe even in Wales, you know? And it's not to be critical. It's just that we've got to have a firm foundation on what we believe and know why we believe, not just what we believe, but why we believe it. And that's why we have this book. And so he goes to, to Rome to look for Paul. He finds him, and, and Paul being the, the apostle, the one that probably, um, and Ephraim was, was led the Lord under his ministry, went back and started this church. And so who else to go to but his own father in the faith, the apostle Paul, and that's what he did. As I mentioned, we, in many ways, we face the same situation today, and, and I believe the way Paul approached it for the spiritual health of the believers in Colossae will be a great benefit to us as well. So there's going to be three things that we're going to look at, um, Lord willing, over the next three weeks, and we're going to use as our text Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, as the basic text for all three of the, uh, the today and the following two weeks, the Lord willing. And here's why we're going to do that. Because I believe that, that Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, are the key verses in that whole book. What goes before leads up to it, and what comes after it naturally flows from, from the truth that Paul lists in, in, in chapters 3, 1 through 4. So in looking at, at um, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 that Daniel read earlier, I was, it provides a summary statement, I believe, of how Paul said we need to deal with the false teachings, not only that we're in the church at Colossae, but, but in order to face the ones that we may come across today. Also, it provides a foundation from what we'll look at going forward next week as we look at the battle within. You know, there's a battle without, and that's the things that come from outside of us and maybe come from outside of the church. But you know, there's a severe battle that's within too. And it's our own flesh. It's our own, um, our own self. Listen, my biggest enemy is me. My biggest enemy is myself. It's not you. It's not anybody else. It's myself. And, and that's what we need. We need, to, so we need to learn how to fight this battle from without, to have the spiritual um, and have the scriptural um, basis for how to confront false teaching. I also need to keep these things in mind for myself. In Sunday school this morning, Peyton talked about a series of things that happened in his life over the, the weather um, that we've, we've had recently. And, um, you know, th those, those things aren't physical. And I think he kind of led, talked about, those are spiritual things. You know, when things pile up like that, it's a test. It's a test. God's in control of everything that happens in our lives. It doesn't catch him by surprise. None of that caught him by surprise. And, and so we can learn from a, from a ruptured water heater and a frozen pipeline and a, and a broke down car. We can learn from all those things, a lost job, a, anything. We can, God can use because, God, listen, God is intimately involved in every aspect of your life, intimately involved in it. And we need to be aware of that. You know, one of the most frightening verses, and I, and I don't have it in here, it just came to my mind that, one of the most frightening things I read this last week was this, out of the book of Judges was, was Samson. You know how Samson, he had a problem with women, much like David did, Solomon did. Um, that's not a critical, being critical of women. I'm just, don't anybody take that the wrong way. It was the man's fault, okay? It was the man's fault. I, I just, well, I gotta be careful. Y'all don't know me well enough to know um, I can just see some on Facebook this afternoon. You wouldn't believe what that guy said. To but see, you know, Delilah was the one that was turned to be his downfall, and she kept after him. The Philistines, if 
find out where his strength is. Well, he gave him one thing after another, and, and finally she wore him down, and he said, well, it's my hair. If you cut my hair, I'll be like any other man. Well, she got the man, cut his hair, and said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he got up and was going to shake himself and said, listen. And he said, he did not know that the spirit had departed from him. What a frightening thing. Amen. Amen. What a frightening thing to realize that, that I mean, to not understand that, listen, the God's favorable presence has departed. It's another example in the Old Testament is when they wrote Ichabod, glory departed. Folks, listen, if the, glory, if the glory ever departs from Wales, if the Spirit of God ever says the favor no longer rests here, folks, you might as well go to, to the country club. But I'm grateful. I, I, I can tell from the first time I ever stepped foot in this pulpit that God's presence is here. It. God's presence is here, and not just here. He said it's here in favor, and I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with all my heart. So not only do we, we're going to look at today the spiritual battle that comes without. Next week, Lord willing, the spiritual battle within, how we battle that. And then thirdly, the Christian's life in a fallen world, dealing with things within our own family. I mean, that's where the big, the big dynamic is, 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 you know, husband to wife, wife to husband, parents to children, and also even our work life as an employee or as an employer. And then in general, what our spiritual life means and our day-to-day -day interaction with people. So that's what we're going to look at, Lord, over the next three weeks. So let's look again at our text. I'm going to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 again. Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Two quick things. Paul says to seek things that are above. He said, set your mind on things that are above. Now that verb, the verb seek and set your mind are continuous action verbs. Present, act, present active. What that means is keep on seeking. It means keep on setting your mind. Listen, you don't just seek God, seek it once. It's a continual seeking. You get up in the morning seeking. <clears throat> During the day, you set your mind on things that are above. And what are those things that are above? And, you know, if you, if you look at an uh, a Greek, uh, English Greek interlinear Bible, you'll see that word thing isn't even in there. Listen, the, what we're to seek aren't things. It's a person. It's who he is. It's where he is. We're to seek the things that are important to him. We're to seek the things that he gave his life for. We're to seek his things that, that he, listen, that he petitions the Father for. Is he not our great high priest at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us? The things, listen, you know the things that he prays for are the things that we ought to be praying for. The things that, that he seeks us for, we ought to be seeking him for. The things that he wants for us, we ought to want for ourselves. And, you know, sometimes that isn't, they don't always match up. I can assure you, my, my wants are not always what Christ wants for me. And sometimes that's a difficult road to walk. When God says, no, it's better for for this. Well, we just sang about it. Sometimes darkness. When darkness seems to hide his face. You ever been there? You ever been through times where it just seems God kind of withdraws? 
I rest on his amazing grace. You mean to tell you one of the most precious times you'll ever have in your life is when darkness comes. And you say, God, I don't understand. I can't see a thing. I don't understand a thing. I don't know if I even know a thing. But God, I trust you. I trust you in the midst of this darkness. I trust you in the midst of this pain. I trust you in the midst of this loss. I trust you. Because I know you are good. Because you said you were. And you don't lie. You don't lie. You see why it's important? We got to know who God is. You'll never know who you are and what your deepest need is until you know who God is and how vast he is. So we read a text again, the spiritual wisdom. Listen, the spiritual wisdom that Paul expresses here gets at the root of much of our Christian struggle. Because we often look to and at and for the wrong things. We look to the wrong things. We look for the wrong things. We set our gaze on the wrong things. And I thought Kevin was going to steal my message this morning in Sunday school because he pointed to this text, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and they also went over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen, I had it on my notes before Kevin got to Sunday school. Okay? I had it on there before he got there, so I'm not copying him. But look real quickly. I've got another one. Just, just look at the one in 2 Corinthians. We've touched, touched on this before. You can look up Romans 8, 18 later, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 16 through 18. Paul's talking about the ministry and the difficulties he has, that he has in, uh, uh, you know, all throughout his ministry, the battles that he faces. Verse 16, he says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Boy, can I get a witness? Outer self wasting away. Outer self wasting away. You know, I, it's that, we've got a little ice maker, a countertop ice maker. And I was opening up a bottle of water to put in there. We, you, I wanted to use bottled water because our tap water, it just leaves deposits all in an ice maker. But anyway, oh, it was all... <laughs> I drink it. I just don't use it in my ice maker. <laughs> but you know, it was hard to get the top off that bottle. I thought, what in the world? I tried to take, and I had to change hands. A water, a bottle, a top off a water bottle. Folks, you know what? I'm wasting away. We were in Sunday school this morning. <laughs> Kevin said he was 45. I leaned over to Debbie and I said, honey, he couldn't even drive when we got married. <laughs> you got a pastor in his prime and you got one that's wasting away. So Amen. we did not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our, look, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Man, let the outside fall apart. It's my inner self that I need restored day by day. Yeah. And I need renewed. For this, look, the light momentary affliction, anything that comes against us and compared to eternity is light. And it's momentary. It's light and it's momentary. It's not eternal. So listen, when that thing comes against you and that darkness comes or that that trial or that tribulation or that persecution, whatever it is that comes against you, first thing ought to be out of our mind, in our mind is this. This is a light, temporary affliction. And not just that. Not just that, but he goes on. He says, it's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. However you think that thing heavy is here, listen, the weight in glory that that's going to bear for your, your spirit far outweighs it. 
It far outweighs it. It's eternal. That's what Paul talks about in the Colossians chapter 3. It means That's what it means to seek and to, to set our minds on the eternal things, especially when we're, when we're confronted with tribulations and, and the heartaches of life. That's when, it, that's when it bears dividends in our spiritual walk with the Lord. That's why we need that, that wisdom in order to do that. Because we're all, nobody's, nobody's um, immune from trials. Nobody is. Nobody is. Are you facing them like a believer should? Like a believer can, like God has equipped us to. He's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness, right? That's what Peter said. Blessed be God who's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And he's done that through Christ. He's given us everything in him, in Christ, preparing us for eternal way to glory beyond all comparison. Verse 18, here's the key. He said, as we look, not to things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. Now, boy, there's a paradox for you, isn't it? Anybody catch it? We keep our eyes on things we can't see. We keep them on what we can't see. Somebody's going to look at a Christian that, 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 that confesses this and think, well, you're crazy. No, I'm not. No, I'm not, because our God is a God of reality. The problem is, what is here is a mirage. You know that? Life here is the mirage. What's real is eternal. What's real is eternal. And that's where we need to have our minds set, have our thoughts there. That's what we need to seek, the eternal things. The eternal things. We look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's where we need to keep our eyes, keep our focus there, keep our vision there. Weigh everything here that, that distracts us from our walk with Christ. And so what is it? I'll tell you something. I'll give you a clue. Whatever it is that, that hinders your walk with Christ is something that's going to pass away one day. Whatever it is, it's hindered. You know, maybe it's your job. Maybe you're putting so much time in at work, day in, day out, half for years, that you just don't have time for. Maybe it's some other kind of special, maybe it's a, a hobby. Maybe it's media, social media. Maybe it, whatever it is, there's something that's hindering your growth. It's not God. It's not God that gets in the way of us fellowshipping with him as we should. It's things of this world, things that we can see and things that we can walk away from in order to grow in our faith. So he said, so the need for us is to keep seeking, to keep setting our minds on things that are above, to keep Christ and what he accomplished on our behalf always, always at the forefront of our minds. And that's exactly what moved Paul in his ministry. Exactly. Look what he said in chapter 1, verse 28 in Colossians. And I know we've touched on this before when we first got started, but I, it, it's, it's worth repeating. In verse 28, look what he says. Him we proclaim. Brother, that's not another message worth, worth proclaiming than Christ. Him we proclaim. And he look, there's three things. He says, warning everyone and teaching everyone that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He repeats everyone three times. And there's a purpose in it. He said, I warn everyone. We teach everyone. And there's a purpose in it. Listen, you don't just warn unbelievers. The warning is not just for unbelievers. We may think it is. But a warning is not just for an unbeliever. Look, if you're not in Christ, you're going to spend eternity separated from God's grace and God's goodness. You'll spend an eternity into God's wrath. Listen, that's not the only. Listen, the warning is for Christ, for, excuse me, for Christians to not forfeit their, their steadfastness. Christians need to be warned as well. 
Listen, you're wandering from the faith. You're believing things you ought not to believe. You're holding to things that are, that are keeping you from the fellowship of other believers. I mean, I, you know, there are people that just kind of attend church now and then that are honestly believers. They need to be warned. It's in the fellowship of believers. We grow. We encourage one another. Paul says later on in, in the book, we'll get to hopefully in, uh, in two weeks. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Listen, the teaching and, and encouraging and warning isn't just for the pastors and the teachers. You're supposed, you know, all of us should be encouraging and speaking the word to one another, teaching one another, every one of us. Every single person that, that names the name of Christ should be growing enough where you can teach somebody else. And that may not be formal setting, like in a classroom, but you've got friends you can teach what God says. you got coworkers. You've got other believers in here that need you. Don't anybody in here think that the body of Christ does not need you. Every single part of the body is needed. Every single part is needed. Even the most obscure part of your body. I mean, let me ask, how, how important is your little toe? I mean, let me tell you how important it is. You make your way back to the bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and catch it on the corner post of your bed you'll learn real quick how important that little toe is because the screaming that little toe will cause, you'll know how important that it's there. You'll know it's there. Listen, every part of the, Paul says time and time again, the body works together. Every part is needed. Even the parts that we think aren't presentable, they're needed. They're needed. You're needed. Others need you, what you have to offer. Warning everyone and teaching everyone. With, he said, uh, uh, with all wisdom, we may present everyone mature in Christ. He said, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Struggling. That's what Paul struggled for. Look, see what he said. I, I think, and I mentioned this before. He said, for this I toil. You know what I admire about Paul? Paul had a laser focus on what his mission was in life. He said, for this, I can name what my life is about. I can name what my purpose is. And it's this, and it's what I struggle for. You remember we touched on this when we originally covered this? You remember what the root word of that word struggle is? It's where we get our word agony. For this, I agonize over. Paul, listen, Paul agonized over the spiritual growth of other believers. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it possible that somebody struggles more for you for your spiritual growth than you do for yourself? Is it possible that someone is praying desperately for you to grow out of whatever stage you're in and your spiritual growth? They ought to be more mature right now, God. And that, that's not being critical. It's just, we, listen, it's the way we deal with our younger children. And if some of you, they have, have, or their parents may be older kids. You've been here, and you've had to confess that you've done some things you shouldn't have done. And maybe your kids wanted to do those things. And they say, throw it up in your face. Well, you did so-and-so. Anybody? Come on. Don't, don't sit there and lie in God's house. You, some of you have been there. Listen, I had to my son one time. And I said, yep, son, you're right. And I, here's what I'm going to tell you about it. You see this road right here? There's a road, right here, and it curves. Got a big curve up here. I've been down that road. I know what's around that curve. 
I wrecked up there. I tore up some things up there. I lost some friends up there. I hurt myself up there. I hurt other people's up there, other people up there. There's wreckage scattered all over that road because I went around that curve. Son, listen to me. That road also turns to the right. I'm telling you, don't go around that curve because of what's there. And you know what? My son, just as hard-headed as I was, and he went around that curve. But you know, believers ought to be able to warn other believers. Look, you're going down a path that's, that, that, that's going to lead to heartache. That's what it means to grow. And we need others to help us. See, some of you have been around a curve I hadn't been. And you may see me heading down or heading to that toward that curve. Look, somebody stop me. Please. Do you love me enough to do it? See, that's where, that's where it comes in. See, do we love somebody enough to confront them when we see them heading toward destruction or heading toward a heartache or heading toward a, a wreck? You know, Paul talks about people making shipwreck of their faith. I wonder how many people stood on the bank and said, well, they ought not to go on. I told them not to go. No, somebody needs to go out there and grab that rope and pull the boat back in. Say, look, I'm not going to let you go. Warning everyone, teaching everyone. Paul struggled with that. He knew what the thing was in his life. He knew what the purpose of it. He said, for this, do you know it? Do you know what the purpose is for your life? Is it tattooed across the your eyelids, can you see it? Do you go to sleep with it at night? Do you, do you dream about it at night? Do you wake up in the morning? Does it come to your mind during the day? For this I toil. For this I'm giving my life. For this I'm spending myself. Paul told the Corinthians, he said, look, I'll gladly spend and be spent for you. You're spending your life for something. Are, is what you're spending it for worth it? When you get to that point in your life, you can't open that water bottle. Are you going to look back and say, well, all my energy was spent in the right way? Spiritually. You're spending yourself right now. It's what you're spending on worth what it's cost is. He warned everyone. He taught everyone. He wanted to see everyone was spiritually mature. It's what he toiled and struggled and he told the Colossians, he said, what a great struggle I had for you. And I put that thought down in the bulletin there. He said, how greatly do we struggle to mature in our walk with Christ? Is it possible that someone else struggles for our walk more than we do for ourselves? I think one of the key verses for facing this kind of teaching, and it plays at churches in, in chapter 2, verse 3, Paul Look what he says here. He said, in Christ, in whom are hidden all the measures, excuse me, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, what these people were doing, they were coming at them with this kind of a secret knowledge or things that, listen, if you know these things, that's what this false teaching was based on that. Paul said, look, you don't need anything else outside of Christ. Christ is all you need. You know that? Christ is all you need. Have you ever seen that meme before on social media? Sunday it said, when you get to the bottom and realize that God is all you have, then you'll realize that God's all you need. Sometimes you do. Sometimes God will take everything away except and just strip your life bare down. And you look up and you say, well, God's been here all along. I was so close to being Samson. So close to being in the same situation as Samson was. But I love the way Paul confronts these, and I've listed them here. I think there's four or five of them. The beginning of verse four in chapter two. Look, each time Paul confronts a false teaching, he always counters it with something about Christ. I thought that was good. I think it's, it's great the way he doesn't argue with them. You know, you can argue with an unbeliever, somebody that doubts God's word. 
You know, you can argue with them all day long. You'll never win somebody by arguing. You know, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. God's word can do what we can't do by arguing. Jesus told a parable about it. About the sower, sowing the seed. Look, sometimes birds are going to come pluck it up from the ground. In other words, Satan's going to come take it right out of the heart of the person you sow it in. Isn't that a frightening thought? That Satan can take the word right out of somebody's heart? You know, there's somebody sitting here this morning, before you get out that door going home, the devil's going to already rip the word out of your heart. That is so frightening to me. I can't do a thing about it. That's not my job. My job is to sow seeds. The other ones are sown. It's it's on stony ground. The word goes in, but it's rocky, and it can't put down roots. And the first time somebody makes fun of them, first time a tribulation or trial or something comes up because of the word, so they fall away. They just wither up and die. I've seen that in churches. You know, you somebody you think's made a, a wonderful profession of faith, and as best you know, they're a believer. And so, you know, you question them, you talk to them, you give some time, and over time you realize, well, I, you know, so you baptize them. Two months later, don't know where they are. They won't return your phone calls. They won't answer the door when you go to visit them. They never come back. Then you have some that the word is sown in a among the weeds. And you see what's happened is they they try to become a Christian, but they don't repent. They want all this clutter in their life. They just think that well, I can look, I can keep all this stuff in Christ too. No. All that stuff will choke the word out. It'll choke it. The only one that bore seed was the one where, where Luke says it fell into the soil. You know how that happens? By the plowing of the Holy Spirit of breaking up a hard heart. When the Holy Spirit, listen, I'm going to tell you something. When the Holy Spirit plows your heart, you know it. You know it. Because it hurts to break up that hard heart. It hurts for God to show you. <laughs> But thank God he does. What grace there is there. Instead, the seed goes in and bears fruit. So Paul answers it with good. Look, first of all, verse 2, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. He said, Paul said, I say this, talking about, when, about all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge being in Christ. He said, I say this, that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. That means to be to deliberately lead somebody astray. And that's what happens all around. You know, somebody, you know, will get wind that you're a believer and then they'll have, they'll come against you with everything in the world that science says contradicts this book or what philosophy says contradicts this book. Listen, if God is not powerful enough to keep this word inerrant and infallible, then I don't know how he ever ever spoke the world into existence. You understand what I'm saying? I don't think anybody's going to ever prove this book wrong. Anybody agree with that? Y'all look asleep. They may say it's not, but God says it is. God's word is settled in heaven. So they they said, well, look, intentionally lead somebody astray. So how did Paul counter? Look at verse 8. I mean, excuse me, verse 5. For though I'm absent in the body, yet I'm present with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding with thanksgiving. Here's how you bat, here's how you come against people. That, could, that, that criticize what you believe and try to deceive you. Don't forget what you've been taught. 
That's what Paul said. Hang on to what you were taught. A lot of people have these, you know, they'll hear something and begin to, to question, well, is this really true or not? I'll tell you one of the first things you ought to do. If you don't know how to go to this book and find the answer, find somebody else can help you in the church. Find another believer. Say, look, somebody said that Christianity can't be true because, and they, they got all these reasons. Get with somebody and find out. Ask them about it. And if they don't know, the two of you go to somebody else. And if you, they don't know, then three of you, listen, start a class and address the things. Find somebody they can teach. Don't just let those things sit there because they'll fester. You know what? Doubts will fester in your heart. And one doubt will lead to another. You understand? Deal with them, with the truth. That's how you deal with falsehood. You can't deal with falsehood by arguing. You deal with falsehood with the truth. Secondly, <clears throat> look at ver uh, chapter ver uh, verses 8 through 15. He also says, See to it no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the, spirits of the world and not according to Christ, for in him, you see, he's doing it again. All these things come against him, these worldly things. He said, for in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you've been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful work of God, who raised him from the dead. You see that in him, with him, Christ died for sin, we die to sin. Christ died for it, we die to it. Paul answers this, these people that come at him and, and trying to take them captive with all this strange, probably a, it involves uh, some worship of angels, it involved showing respect unto these angelic beings and that they, in, order to, in order to gain favor with God. That was part of what this false teaching was. And, and Paul was saying, look, you don't have to show obedience to any other creature except God himself. He is the one we're to obey. He's the one that we're, he has provided a way for us to be accepted to him, and it's through Christ. It's not through any other mediator. There's one mediator between man and God, and that's Jesus Christ. No other mediator's needed. You don't need Mary. You don't need a priest. You don't need an angel. We've got a high priest at the right hand of the Father. He is our mediator. He's our mediator. We don't need another. Look at verse 16 through 19. He said, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Hebrews deals with this, I mean, in numerous chapters, the fact that people still clung to, to the ordinances and the, and the ceremonial law in some cases, and, and all those things pointed to Christ. All those things pointed to Christ. And he's saying, look, if, you're, if, if somebody's judging you because you're not, you're not keeping the new moon and the Sabbath and, and all the, look, Christ has fulfilled all that. You see? Christ has fulfilled it all. Let no one disqualify you, verse 18, in, in insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason of essential mind and not holding fast to the head. You see what they were doing? They were playing all these mind games with these people. Listen, Christ was the head. Christ is the head. We're the body. And Christ is the head. We don't need to appeal to any of these. And I wish I had my CSB, my Christian Standard Bible, because the, the translation of that, going on about visions, boy, it just spoke to, to today. I don't, brother, I don't know if you got the Christian Standard Bible. 
Do you have it on there? Do we? Yeah, can we? I'm sorry, folks. Can we do? Kevin, pull that up. Read, read that out of the Christian stand. Because I mean, it. Yeah. No, for the latter part of eighteen. Yeah. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. Access to a visionary realm. Visionary realm. Man, I want to tell you what. You look on some of these, these TV preachers, and they'll tell you they've gone to heaven and they've seen all kinds of things. Multiple trips there, and they'll come, and these people are in all of them. They got these Colosseums full of people. And they're made up things in their own mind, folks. How in the world are people paying money to go hear these charlatans speak about visions that they had of angelic beings and and and, and talking to, to Christ? And one of them even said, Well, look, I know what God looks like. He's about six foot seven. And wait. What? Jesus said, God is a spirit. God doesn't have a body. You see how, and people just fall for this. You see how it's important for us to know what God's word said? And people fall, people have been falling for this stuff for 2,000 years. And they're still doing it today. Wouldn't you think somebody would step up and say, wait, wait. Christ has accomplished on our behalf what the false teachers insisted were requirements to have access to God. That's what Paul, because they were condemning you for people for not following those things in verses 16 through 19 and judging people because you didn't do certain things. You know, those, those you know, there's places right now that you know, if women wear makeup, you're not allowed in the church. You know, if you have on jewelry, you're not. You know, listen, I pastored a church one time. First church ever pastored. And boy, was I ignorant. The previous pastor had, they'd had a man, a young boy, teenage boy, come forward to receive Christ. And he prayed, and they introduced him after the service. And don't you hear what the pastor told this young boy? He says, son, you come back next week with your hair cut, and we'll baptize you. Now, I don't know how long his hair was. But listen, I got a feeling it didn't matter. I, I, it didn't matter. The point was... They were, this pastor, this Baptist pastor was judging this young boy based on the length of his hair and said, we'll help you, we'll help you grow in your Christian life and further your Christian life if you'll get your outside appearance right. Folks, I just got a feeling God's able to deal with those things. That's right. That's right. You know that? God's able to deal with those things. Now, there are some things that, you know, ought to be dealt with early on, but the length of hair isn't one of them. You see, that's, you see how we are? We're so judgmental of people. Last thing, verse 20 through 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all, uh, all parishes are used according to human precepts and teaching. These have a, indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body, but, get this, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You know, you can practice all those things in the world, but you know what? It does not affect your heart. That's our problem. We want to indulge our flesh. Our flesh craves things. Our, our, our fallen nature still, that's, that's why 
That's why we're still our own biggest enemies, ourselves. And we've got to know how to curb our flesh. And you don't do it. Listen, you don't do it by, by not eating pork. You don't, eat, do, you don't do it by stop eating shellfish. You know, there are people out there now that say, well, if you're a Christian, why are you eating catfish? <laughs> well, the law forbade it. The, law, the food laws don't matter anymore. Bring the catfish on. <laughs> and the hush puppies and the fried shrimp. You know, I, I'm saying people, it's amazing to me. And you know, believers don't know our Bible enough to, to understand where the law stops and where grace begins. Right. And they don't know the right place for the law in the life of a believer. The law does apply to us. You know that? We're free from the curse of the law, but now we're free to obey it. Not the dietary laws, not the ceremony. Listen, he set us free to obey the law of God. You're free now to obey because you want to. Can I tell you what? Before, I didn't want to. I didn't want to worship God. I didn't want to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I didn't want to love my neighbor more than I love myself. I can assure you of that. <laughs> I didn't. But I can tell you now, dude. Now, dude. You know, I, I don't, I might know the names of one out of ten people in here. Give me time, folks. But I can honestly say I love every one of you. I love every one of you. And that's not come from me, because that's not Steve. You know why I can love you? Because I know God loved the unlovable in me. That's why I can love other people. You don't have to be a certain way for me to love you. And thank God, I think people in this church are by and large that way. You know what? It's, it's what I said the first Sunday I preached here as a, as a pastor. You know, if we just let grace rule, if we just let God's grace rule in our own lives, and we'll let grace guide us in dealing with one another. Isn't that what we need? We just, listen, I need a healthy dose of God's grace every day. And we need to look for one, to one another for grace. And we can look for each, each one, look to one another to love one another. And part of that is bearing, bearing with one another. Forgiving one another. Again, we'll get to this in two weeks, but Paul says in Colossians, he said, forgiving one another as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. You know, the level, the, the, the level of forgiveness I'm to have for other people, the depth of forgiveness I'm to have for others is the same depth I wanted God to have for me. And Paul says later on in chapter 3, what all of my violations, all my, he said, God nailed it to the cross. If he nailed mine to the cross, I don't have any reason to put yours up on a billboard. Listen, folks, what Paul says is true. In Christ, we have all we need, all the wisdom. All the knowledge we need is in Christ. And if we'll give ourselves, if we'll give ourselves together and individually to learn this book, then you'll protect yourself against deception. And when you hear this weird stuff, your antenna will start going up. And you'll realize, hey, that doesn't sound, something's not right there. We need that spiritual antennas, and that's what Paul is trying to give the Colossians. And that's what we need today. That's what we need. To, we need to understand, not just to know what we believe, but why we believe it. And that's what Paul has given the Colossians. And that's what we need. 
That's what we need today. So you, we need one another. We need one another desperately. The false teacher, listen, I'm going to close with this. The false teachers say this. Here's what they were saying. Do this, and God will accept you. The gospel says, Christ has done it all. Come. That's right. Amen. Amen. Those false teachers were saying, do. Jesus stands outside the tomb, and he says, done. Amen. Amen. Either do or done. Hallelujah. What are you trusting in? The one is telling you, do this and be accepted, or the nail-scarred hands that say, it's done, come to me. Come to me. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you so much. God, we're forever grateful that Jesus paid it all. And Father, he bids us come with nothing in our hands but God the sin that made that cross necessary. We have nothing else to offer. So Father, I pray that you would rescue some this morning. God, rescue believers from any false teaching that they've they bought into. God, rescue someone that is not even a believer. God, that's in the clutches of the enemy. God, rescue people this morning, we ask. In the name of Christ and for your, your glory. Amen. Amen.